So when Eddie taught last week, one of the things that he was focusing on was the idea of goals when you're teaching a class and how important it is that you do have a goal and that you have a purpose. And that in addition to that, that your students know what that goal is. You know, it's important that you know where you're going, but it's important that your class, your students, they know what your purpose is also. In other words, you need to know why you're there. They need to know why you're there. Uh, when I was a sales manager, I would often kind of give my young reps a hard time. We'd pull up to a business. I'd say, okay, why are we here? And say, well, we're going to sell them something. Like, okay, why do they think we're here? And if those two things weren't the same, I didn't like our chances too much. And so it's the same thing teaching the class. And with that spirit in mind, I just wanted to quickly revisit, you know, we're, we're about halfway through this series. So I wanted to revisit kind of the why behind what we're doing here. Why did we decide to have this men's training series in the first place? And if you look in your booklet, if you guys still have those, it, it lays it out pretty well on the first page. You know, Dempsey has this, this goals section. So what are our goals? To help you learn to serve in areas where you would like to, but felt you couldn't. I might add, or are a bit nervous or afraid to, a bit uncomfortable with. To help you improve in service you're already doing now, things you're already serving. Help you be prepared to do work you may never expect to do, but may end up having to do. And help you be convinced you're neither too young nor too old to develop into greater service in the Lord. And so in a nutshell, the goal for all of us as men of this congregation, as leaders of this congregation, is to become better equipped for the ministry and building up the body of Christ, just as we see in Ephesians 4.12. And so I just wanted to, to mention that again, just because we're kind of at a halfway point, but you know, the purpose of this series is to help all of us get better and hopefully help all of us be willing to step into roles we haven't done before. And we need that. We always need that. We always need people willing to teach, people willing to speak. So tonight we're going to focus again really more on teaching pretty much in a, in a classroom type setting, but doesn't necessarily have to apply that. But a lot of my examples and what I'm gonna focus on, we're thinking of being in a classroom setting, whether that's a class like this, one of the young people's classes downstairs or evangelism in a class with just one or two other people. And so I truly do hope this can be helpful to you all and can help you feel more confident and comfortable in, in stepping into the classroom and teaching yourself. So what I'm going to focus on are really just two, what I'll call tactics or strategies, tools that you can use when teaching. And that's asking questions and telling stories. And when I think about teaching, in my mind, I kind of boil it down to really just two different styles. If you Google teaching styles, you'll find a whole bunch of fancy language and nice terms, but to me, there's really two different ways to do it. You've got a lecture style, and you've got what I'll just generically call a dialogue style. And again, there's, there's probably a better, more technical term for it. And so lecture style, I think, is maybe what we think of when somebody says, hey, you're willing to teach a class. You know, a lecture style is, we all know what that is, but it's me standing up here for 45 to 50 minutes and just delivering all the information to you. And I've got to do that all by myself, right? It's more like a, that's like a sermon or even a speech, but that's a lecture style. And that can be very effective. And there's men in this room that are very good at that. I'm not one of them, but that's kind of the lecture style. And to me, that's the more daunting task of the two because it's all on me, right? If I'm doing a lecture style class, I've got to deliver that whole 45 minutes. It's not likely you're going to have a lot of interaction during that. But the dialogue style, on the other hand, to me is not nearly as daunting because in theory, at least, you're gonna have a little help, right? There's going to be some back and forth. And we see a lot of this style in the New Testament. We see lecture style, of course, too. You know, there's plenty of sermons, Sermon on the Mount, Peter's Sermon on the Day of Pentecost and many others. But we see a lot of, of what I'm calling the dialogue style. You know, Jesus just talking with Nicodemus, Philip talking with the Ethiopian eunuch. We see the idea of reasoning together. We see those words a lot. In Acts 17, it says that Paul was reasoning with the Jews and the devout persons. Well, that 
implies a dialogue, right? That implies a back and forth. So the main thing that sets the dialogue style apart from lecture style is that you've got that interaction. And so the challenging thing for a teacher then, if I'm teaching and I wanna have a dialogue style classroom, it's kind of up to me to spark that interaction, right? You may get somebody to raise their hand now and then, but really it's up to you as the teacher to make that happen. And so how do you make that happen? Well, you do what I just did. You ask questions. That's the way you cause that interaction to happen. That's the way you spark that and hopefully get things going. So let me ask a question. What are benefits of asking questions when teaching? Okay, so disclaimer, I'm now switching from lecture style to dialogue style. Oh. <laughs> it's when you ask questions and you can get the class involved in personal life with what you're talking about. Because I think you have a tendency to think that like, there's only one answer, there's one right way. Like, what's the plan of information? That's like one, there's one way. But there's a lot of issues where the answer that, that you give is not always going to be the same. How are you going to serve the Lord? Mm -hmm. It's not going to be the same answer for every single Christian because some Christians are going to be an optical, they're going to be hands or they're going to be foot. And so if you just lecture, it has to be totally generic and apply to everybody. If you can generate discussion, then it becomes specifically better than those individuals who are dangerous. Very good. So if I were to try to sum up what you said, <clears throat> it'll it gets the person more engaged and allows it to, to be more personal, what you said, personalized to them. Good. Anybody else? You know, benefits of asking questions when you're teaching? Yes. If Mike was saying something, I might not see that same perspective that he's given that he or that he's on. And now I see what he's saying, like, mm -hmm. oh, I missed that. Or, yep. You know, or vice versa. But, you know, either way, it's now you're having that dialogue, not only with the person that's talking to you that asked the question, but you're going to run through and you gain their perspective as well. And that's actually a, a good reason why it's so helpful to the class as a whole when people answer questions. Right, instead of just me having to answer them for you. No, you're exactly right. Thanks, Cole. Is somebody is that you, David, or somebody else started to say something? Yeah, especially if I start calling on people. <laughs> no, that's good. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the uh, the booklet that we have put together lists out some of these reasons too, and some we just said. <clears throat> but I'll I'll look at a couple of these too. So it provokes thinking. I'll say if your question is thought provoking, then it will. Hopefully it is. Uh, arouse curiosity. I think that can be a very good thing. Holds attention, kind of what David was saying. You know, if your class figures out that you're the kind of teacher that asks questions, they're going to pay more attention. And I'm not just picking on kids' classes, adult classes the same way, you know, especially if, if you're somebody that likes to just point and call on people. But it will hold their attention a little bit more. You can direct attention. You know, I really like that idea. You know, as a, as a teacher of a class, typically, unless it's a true just sit down kind of discussion, but if it's really a class and you do have a goal and purpose in mind for that class, you've got to keep it on track to some extent. And so the questions you ask can do that. You know, just like right now, I'm asking about the benefits of asking questions. because That's what I want to be talking about. So you can keep it directed and where you want it to be. Let the student express his or her thoughts, keeps them involved. That, that was Mike's point. I really like this one. Provides an opportunity to further instruct. What does that mean? I think it means they're wrong. <laughs> I think that's a nice way of saying the answer is wrong. Uh, but thank you for answering, Eddie. We appreciate it. And then you gently guide them to where the right answer is. But I found that one kind of funny. So if you're looking at your booklet, you may have noticed I skipped a couple. And that's not because I don't like those, because I think they're in my opinion, the two most important. And I wanted to slow down and look at those. So one of them says it directs attention to the important and away from the unimportant. That's a bit of a word salad there, but like 
directs attention to the important away from the unimportant. Anybody care to try to venture what that means? Eddie? I can see that is when a discussion starts to get off track, the leader of the discussion can ask a question that points back to where the track is. Mm -hmm. Without just simply saying, okay, we're getting off track. That might come across as being rude, but if you instead of ask a question that brings you back to where you're, what you're going towards, yes. then everybody just kind of naturally comes back to yeah, I do that all the time in sales situations. <clears throat> By the way, you'll hear me make um, comparisons quite a bit to my job because there, there's just a lot of similarities here. I ask questions constantly in my job as a salesperson and teaching and selling have a lot in common sometimes. Dempsey? Jesus used this strategy of teaching a great deal. Yeah, mm -hmm. he learned Jesus, so we know it's a wonderful way to add to our teaching technique. Mm -hmm. Uh, but one of the things he did in teaching was to draw attention to the important the parable of the Good Samaritan. The lawyer said, Who is my neighbor? That's in my notes. And then okay, <laughs> and, and she directed the attention back to the real question, which is, you know, which one proves to be a neighbor? Right. Is it, are you a neighbor? Mm -hmm. yep. So he used that a lot in right to Jesus. Absolutely. And that's I had two examples. <clears throat> excuse me, from Jesus teaching. One of them is from the Good Samaritan. The other is in Matthew 19, uh, verses three through six. And this is where one of the Pharisees, or it just says the Pharisees, plural, you know, are trying to test him, trying to trick him, asking him about divorce. But let's turn there quickly. <clears throat> And I'm curious to see if, if you all kind of interpret this the same way I did. But I think this is an example of what Dempsey's talking about also, but this idea of directing away from the unimportant. So starting in verse three, and Pharisees came up to him and tested him by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? So I really like that he answers the question with a question, right? He's ready to teach. He's coming right back at him. Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two become one flesh. And so the Pharisees have a focus on one, they're, they're trying to test him, which I take as, you know, trying to, trying, trying to trap him somehow. Their focus is on their intentions, their goals. Their focus is on what men have taught what men have said what rabbis have said over the years about marriage and divorce right and so jesus immediately directs them to the word he immediately directs them have you not read meaning have you not read from the word that he who created them so he takes them right back to the word and to god and so to me that's an example of taking them from the unimportant to the important does that make sense Anybody see that a different way or anything to add to that? And then D Dempsey mentioned it, but I still want to look at it quickly because I just love it. But uh, in Luke 10, Parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke 10, starting in 25. It's funny, Eddie, because you referenced the Parable of the Good Samaritan last week. And when you did, I put big circles and stars. I'm like, I'm going to use this. this. This actually addresses both of my topics. Jesus does both things in this, uh, this section of scripture, the whole dialogue and the parable itself. But starting in 25, and behold, a lawyer stood up to again put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength and all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you've answered correctly, do this and you will live. And so, first of all, I really like the way Jesus answers that with a question that to me is kind of like the, come on, you already know the answer to this. You know, well, what, what's it written? What's it say? You know, what does God say? And so again, he's, he's doing the same thing. He's taking this person who's focused on himself 
He's focused on how do I get eternal life? You know, how do I attain this for myself? And he takes it to, again, the word. Well, what's written? You really don't need to be asking me. You know what's there. What's it say? And we do that all the time, don't we? Let's go to the word. But also shifts the focus to the important of it's about your love for God. It's about how you treat others. It's about the neighbor. And so then the, the, the lawyer, I always imagine this being said in kind of a snarky tone of voice. They're like, oh, yeah, well, who's my neighbor? You know, maybe not. That's how I imagine it. And I just love the way Jesus handles this. You know, he doesn't directly answer that question. He proceeds to tell a parable. And I'll come back to that when we talk about the value of telling stories when you teach. But he tells the parable. And then he says to him, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? So again, Jesus taking that question of, well, who's my neighbor, which I interpret to mean like, okay, who do I have to be nice to? Who do I, who, who do I have to love? To No, you need to be the neighbor yourself. You need to be looking for people to love. That's what the word says. That's what God says. So that's what I see as, as a couple of changing the focus from the unimportant to the important. Anybody else have any other examples or any other thoughts on that use of questions? I, I think the question where they were challenging Jesus is it lawful to pay the poll tax? Mm -hmm. They were trying to bring up a situation that they thought would divide the crowd against Jesus. But he does the same thing. He asked them a question who's, who's mentioned on this point? Right. And they tell him, it's either say, okay, well, this law is you, you give it to the law of him, but you give to God the law of him. He takes them back to what really matters. Amen. And he has to do that all throughout his ministry, even with his apostles, because they, they're expecting one kind of king and he's bringing a different kind of kingdom. But but he specifically does it with questions here. <clears throat> Anybody else? Do you think, too, that it's possible that Jesus's teaching style may have shifted to more of a dialogue or, as you said, dialogue style of teaching and asking questions, maybe because some of the other people that were already teaching during that time were teaching more so a lecture style of teaching? Could be. And, and maybe for him, it was just more so he wanted people to engage in conversation with him mm -hmm. and find the truth for himself without like speaking the law, speaking the truth in. Well, I think too, I think you're right. And also think, you know, we think of Jesus as a personal savior, right? We have a personal relationship with him. And you know, Matt and I have a personal friendship that comes from having had dialogue together. You and I do, you know. So I, I think you're right. I think maybe. It could be that as well. Yeah, good point. To, to this good point, uh, you know, with Acts 20, uh, Reverend, when it says, on birthday of the week, they came together and bring bread, and Paul began speaking to them. Mm -hmm. uh, the Greek word gives us our English for dialogue. So that occasion when he was in Troas, when the dialogue, that the power of the power of the power of the power of the There you go. Yep, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it, it clearly is an, an example for us. Again, sermon lecture style is too, but we see a lot of what I'm generically calling a dialogue style. So there's another one I skipped over. And this one is very, very simple and basic, but it really might be the most important one, uh, especially teaching probably, I think, in a one-on-one -on -one setting or with an evangelistic setting, which is it helps the teacher know what the student understands and how much the student understands. And I would say, it helps you know what they know or don't know, right? And that's something that we all, we kind of inherently realize that, that we don't want to start teaching to somebody without knowing what they know. But I'm telling you from experience, sometimes you just forget to do it. You forget to ask the right questions so you can figure out what somebody knows. I mean, you think about if, if we can think back to our freshman year of high school and it's algebra one or whatever, what's the first thing most teachers do? That first day, they make you take what? This is dialogue style. This is like, <laughs> like an assessment, yeah. They want to do an assessment so they know what you know and what you don't know. They get an idea, right? I do this all the time in my job. I don't want to start 
explaining something that I think is a complicated subject or concept to somebody if they already know what that is. That's annoying and I'm wasting their time, but I also don't want to start launching into this sales pitch all based on this complicated idea and they got no idea what it means. So it's the same thing in Bible teaching. We need to know, is our student here in conceptual understanding or are they here? I mean, think how differently Jesus would have handled it if when he said, well, how do you read it? What does it say? And they're like, oh, he would have handled that situation differently, correct? And so again, I know that's very basic, but it's something to remember to do. Yeah. So I, I asked the middle school class what probable means. Nobody knew. So we were about to launch into the, the, the study of the prodigal son without maybe realizing that the entire audience, if we are aware of what they even mean. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm constantly wrong in the middle and high school class about what I think they're going to know and, and what they don't know. I'll think, okay, this is easy. I don't have to explain that. And then they don't know it and vice versa. I'm wrong all the time. So I have to just start asking. But yeah, I like to do that too, Mike. I, if I, I like to just say, do, do y'all know what this word actually means? Because it's important if the whole rest of the lesson is built upon it. Yeah, that's great. But yeah, it's, um, again, that, that's a basic thing to do. But and we're, if we're thinking about, you know, stepping into a class and not having taught before, starting there and just trying to get, give yourself a good basic picture of where everybody is will help you tremendously. And it will hopefully help you not lose your audience. Because again, you, you don't want to be explaining something to somebody that they already know, but you also don't want to jump too far ahead and they're not with you to begin with. So it's just a good reminder. We should have added this section here to do. The question also gave an opportunity to challenge someone's conviction. Mm -hmm. Because in God, shows us that at the beginning, he asked Adam, Where are you? Right. He knows where, he is, where are you? You know where you are. So it's an opportunity to challenge their conviction. They are like, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Yeah, yeah three me. times. Yeah. Yep, yeah, that's exactly right. And that's. There's a little bit of that in here when it, it talks about the different kinds of questions, when it talks about choice questions. Uh, but that's actually what I was going to go to next, unless anybody else had anything else on the, the benefits of asking questions. Yeah. Yeah. Eddie. Yeah. Sure. One of the most effective uh, personal evangelists that I, that, I know, that I know personally is Jim Elliot. Mm -hmm. And he's the most important thing to do at the beginning is ask questions like what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. But he actually writes down the answers. One of the students. Okay. And he, he went over to Ethan. Now you said you said this. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to the point that Jensen just brought up because when he's teaching and it gets to a point where the Bible is teaching something that is different than what they believe, he will come back and he'll turn it back not to rub their face in it, but just kind of come back and say that you said you believe this. Right. But what did you just read right here? Mm -hmm. And that gives them that opportunity to see here's what god is saying and here's what i believe what am i going to do with that amen and that's also that's very very personal that that is not a generic study he's having that's a very personal study with that individual you know what is it that you believe what do you want to see i love that that's a great example so the book goes into different types of questions um this has been hit on we've kind of been on the the periphery of this but You've got factual questions, which are what they sound like. You know, this is a question that has a right answer, and that's the right answer. It said, I, I call those, we call those in sales training, closed-ended questions. There's, there's one answer, or it's either yes or no, right? You don't want those in sales, but they can be good in Bible study. I think they're particularly good uh, with the younger classes. You know, this is kind of your memorization stuff, right? This, this, and this is good. We want the the history. We want understanding which books are where and what's in these books. And usually when I'm doing this with the middle school or high school class anyway, I, I, this is kind of where I do trivia games and things like that a few times a quarter because they like it and it's fun, but we're also getting those good factual questions in there and making sure they, that they know the basics, I would call it. But I don't think you want to do a ton of factual questions because they don't really lead to discussion. It's just, you know, it's A, B, C, or D and that's it, right? And so the next level that it has here, what the, the whoever made this lesson calls interpretive questions, which is interpreting the scripture. The example here is what did the rock 
in the passage I've referenced to. I'm sure that's talking about you or Peter upon this rock I build my church. And so these are very, very good. I like to ask interpretive questions, especially in the middle and high school, because if we're not teaching them how to read this scripture and try to figure out for themselves what it means, well, then we're not teaching them how to study. We're only teaching them facts at that point. And I don't think facts are going to get you to heaven. You need that understanding to be able to truly study. And they're fun because there's not necessarily a right answer. In some cases, there may be kind of an agreed upon answer or an accepted answer, but it's not super, super hardcore. And so it's fun to ask those kind of questions. Reasoning questions are probably my favorite. And so this is the why. I love to talk about this in the middle and high school class. You know, we've got every, everything in scripture is important, right? Everything's there for a reason. And so why? Why is it here? You know, last week we studied the account of the Magi coming and seeing Herod and then going to see Jesus. Well, why is this here? Why did the Lord feel important to have this account? You know, why do we have the account of Peter denying Jesus three times? There's all kinds of these, right? That they're, they're there. We know there's a reason God put them there, but we may not know exactly why. And so we just have to ask ourselves. And you ask your students, you ask your class, and you get lots of different answers. And it's always fun because, you know, I'll have my answers in mind already as the teacher, but I'll always get one I hadn't thought of. And so in that way, I'm learning too right, the whole time, but I think it's really, really important to challenge your students on that. You know, it's one thing to know the facts. It's one thing to be able to interpret and understand what it means, but it's a whole different level to understand why God wants us to understand it, and so then that kind of moves to the next level, which is application questions, which is basically, okay, I know this stuff. I know how to read it. I know what it means. I think I know why God put it there. Now, how do I apply that to my life? How does this account that was written 2,000 years ago apply to me in 2023 as a Christian? And those, again, those are very, very important questions to ask your students, whether they're 65 or 15. How do we apply this? And that'll lead to great discussion. The fifth, I think, is a little bit, to your point, Dempsey, of, of challenging. Uh, the booklet describes these as choice questions. I might call them action questions which is basically, okay, we've got this knowledge now. We've studied it. We understand it. We know what it means. We know why it's there. What are you going to do with it? And that has to be part of evangelism. That absolutely has to be, if you're doing a study with someone trying to convert them, you, you, you've got to get to the point, correct me if I'm wrong, MC, but you've got to get to the point where you're asking them, okay, what are you going to do? Are you going to come to Jesus? Are you going to be baptized? But I think you can do it in a class as well. I mean, if you're covering the Good Samaritan and we've just learned how God wants us to treat people, it's fair to ask the question, okay, so next week, what are we going to do? That's a little bit similar to application, but it's more tuned in on a specific person. What's your action going to be? What's your choice going to be? Is that your hand again? Or are you just stretching? Okay. Um, so any comments or questions on, on just those different types of questions? Or, can you see how those will be used? Yes? Whichever kind of question you're asking, it really helps to put a lot of thought into what questions you're going to ask the class and why you're going to ask the question. Particularly with the factual questions, there's a tendency sometimes to kind of ask very, not really that important or almost trivial factual questions. Right. Which can be incorporated, which can be incorporated into a a uh, uh, more of an open-ended question, thought question, 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 question,
of what's going on in that passage and why it's there and what Jesus is teaching us. Yep. It still gets in that idea that it's three times, but in a way that is a much more sophisticated and a much more thoughtful approach. Completely agree. I mean, in general, factual questions, you know, like I said, are, are not, they're not going to lead to much else, right? You're going to get the answer, and then you're just looking at everybody again. But you're, you're right, you can very easily reword it in a different way and turning into an open-ended question that way. And you can take it other, like, why did Jesus do that? And then why do we think God wants us to see that? What do we learn from that? You can keep on going from there. I have a question, and I think you asked me in class. If you just tell someone off and tell the questions you had all before, but usually mm -hmm. I've got most of my questions listed. Yep. And I will really read them and ask myself, is there any value in this question? What am I trying to accomplish by asking this question? And the answer is, I'm not really sure. <laughs> I cross it down. Yep. Ask and, and you're getting to, to my last little bit on this, which is there are some pitfalls to asking questions. And it's good to know this going into it. You know, when you... When you're doing a lecture style, you're driving the whole time, right? You're in charge. You've got complete control unless something very weird happens. But when you're going to ask questions, you're letting go of the wheel for a minute, right? And when you do that, you, you may have a hard time getting it back. So asking questions can derail the class a little bit. So to Mike's point, it's an excellent point, and you've got to have already thought that through. Um, I, don't, I may not get to stories, but stories are the same way. I don't think it's a good idea to just venture off into a story because it pops in your head because it may not sound as good coming out as it did in your head. You know, you may think it's really on topic and then you're about halfway through like, Oh no, what am I doing? And you know, that's, that's a mistake. Um, but questions are the same way. I think it's very, very important. Have already thought those through that challenges you too, because if you're going to have some reasoning questions and some application questions, really, really thought provoking questions, you better have some answers already because you might not get any answers back from the class or you may not really get the ones that you were hoping to drive home. So in, just in studying, preparing for that class, it's going to cause you to have a much more in-depth study of that book or that chapter or that topic if you plan ahead to have those questions in there. But yeah, you're 100% right. And you're fantastic at this. I love the way you ask questions. You don't Outweigh your audience. It can be awkward sometimes to stand up there and not say anything. Yes. You should be quite often that someone will you know, take one for the team and answer the question. For so let's talk about that. That's pitfall number two. Sometimes you'll be answered with silence when you ask questions. And so, as I see it, you've got three options. You can be like Mike is saying, and I just call that marinating in the awkwardness. You just sit there in the silence. You just embrace it. I do this in sales all the time, and it's fun. Um, I'll ask a, a buying question and then just sit there for a long time sometimes, and it's awkward, but I just marinate in it. Uh, but you can do that, and you're right. Eventually, somebody will probably say something. Uh, that's not always time efficient, though. So you may want to just go ahead and have had your answer ready. Yes, sir? I was high school students. You guys want to hear me keep talking? Or do you want to <laughs> I like that. That's good. That's good. Um, so you can challenge them, like Matt said. If you don't hear what Matt said, he said to the high school class, do you want to hear me keep talking or do you want to talk? And they'll answer. That's good. Uh, but you can embrace the silence or you can go ahead and answer yourself. Or I like to do this. You can just call on somebody. If you ask a question nobody's answering, I've done it to you. Let's see that. <laughs> that doesn't always, you'll, you'll get something. It may not be the answer you were hunting for, but you'll get something. Uh, another pitfall is, is sometimes you, and this is really a good one, but this has happened to me too. You may have your question answered with another question that you can't answer yourself. <laughs> and so now in my viewpoint, you got a couple of choices. If you have, if this is in a one-on-one -on -one evangelism type effort, then I think absolutely you slow down and you go to the Bible and find the answer. If it's in a classroom and we got five minutes left, then I think it's important to just admit you don't know it. You know, I don't, there's nothing wrong with being open like that, but commit to that student that you're going to find that answer and you're going to get back to him. And then you have to do that. Extremely, extremely important that you do that. Um, so those are just a few pitfalls, but there are far more pros to asking questions than cons. Um, I think that between the lecture style of teaching and the dialogue style of teaching, it's again, it's, it's far less intimidating to walk into a class and to teach if you're ready with lots of good questions. 
and you've already thought that out. That, to me, that is not as daunting of a task as trying to deliver 45 minutes of information and material uninterrupted, unassisted. Make sense? And again, some of y'all are great at that. I'm not. Um, I think I've got three minutes. So moving on from questions, stories are also very, very important. And it's funny, I was thinking about this. I probably could have taught this class in 30 seconds because I really could have just said, why is it so important for us to ask questions when we teach and tell stories when we teach? Because that's how Jesus did it. Class dismissed for like 10 seconds, really. But we know Jesus did this. Jesus constantly was telling stories as his teaching. We call them parables, right? Good Samaritan, the wedding feast, prodigal son, soil, on and on and on. So I guess really the question is, why did he do that? Why did Jesus was always answering a question, either with another question or by just launching into a parable. Why do we think he did that? Encouraging the listener to send the signs to something that they have as depends on the Bible, that they already understand, encourages that continued understanding, that they did it better to their own memory and understanding if they made that leap themselves. Yeah, you hit on a couple of the things there. It telling it, telling a story takes whatever the point is you're trying to make, whatever that topic is, whatever the the biblical moral you're trying to teach, and just puts it into real life action, right? It also makes it more memorable. I mean, we all know these parables and we all know the point of them. We know the point of them probably better than we do sometimes the little details of the story itself, right? We know what the point of the parable of the Good Samaritan is. We know what the point of the prodigal son is. Um, you know, Jesus would tell parables that revolved around things that the people at that time would have understood in their everyday life, like farming and traveling. Eddie? And, and I think you're an excellent point there. I think that's very true. I would dare say that with most of us, the story of the prodigal son or the story of the Good Samaritan is more fresh in our mind, more solid in our mind than Jesus quotation of scripture before the Good Samaritan, for the context of the prodigal son, mm -hmm. where the, the tribe of the Pharisees were complaining because Jesus was eating and gathering from the tax gathering. Completely agree. Yeah. One of them is the solid scriptural foundation, mm -hmm. and the other is the illustration. And, and I think you're right. Both of those illustrations become more memorable to do it. I agree, and, and very quickly, I know we're out of time, but this this applies to preaching, I think, too. I mean, this applies to sermons, Lord's Supper talk, Wednesday night talk. If you can fit a little story in there, you're going to get your audience paying more attention. I will always, no matter how much I'm already listening, I'll always perk up a little bit more if the speaker starts telling a story. It, it's just different. It changes the complexion of the talk that you're already giving when you tell a story. They got to be on point. That's why I said it needs to be a pre-planned story. I wouldn't just launch off into, into nowhere. Um, but to sum up very quickly, teaching in class doesn't have to be a scary, daunting task. It is demanding. It is a commitment. But I really believe that if you can plan well, and I, when I talk about overcoming fear, I'll talk a lot more about preparation. It's all about preparation. But if you can plan to have good questions in there, if you can plan to have a couple of good stories, then the time will fly by and you'll get a lot of participation. Um, and you will find that doing that, preparing that way, not only is going to hopefully result in a good class for your students, but it's going to enrich your own study of the work. Teaching class does that anyway. But I think when you challenge yourself to do it this way, it's going to enrich your own study quite a bit. So thank you all. Thanks for the participation and the attention.